Hello, and welcome to Fails, Falls, and F-Ups. And you might notice that I am using the polite version of the title. But that's because <clears throat> joining me today is somebody who is, well, kind of special to me. This is a young lady I have known for going on 11 or 12 years, and I met her when she was just 14 years old. But she had her own company going, doing animation, and she did the very first animation that was ever done for me. It is Danny Bowman of Danimation Entertainment. Danny, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much, Bruce. And thank you so much for having me be part of the show. Thank you for joining me. As, as you know, I always love being in your presence. And you are an amazing person. Like, truly, you know, I'm supposed to say that about everybody. Everybody's an amazing person. But you really are. I mean, to start with, you started your career very young. I think you were either 12 or 13 when you actually began moving it forward. Uh, you also are an autism advocate. You are on the spectrum. Your days are incredibly full. You're the most driven person I've ever met. You're more driven and intense than most professional MMA fighters. It's amazing how much energy you have to drive your stuff forward. How did that start? How did you go from being a young girl, practically not even a teenager yet, to being, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to create professional animation. You could say that I've been animating ever since before, ever since I've picked, ever picked up a pencil. How old? I was um, doing a little stop motion animations when I was just a very teeny, teensy weensy little, um, teensy weensy little one. Five, six. What I did in the beginning is that I used to do little stop motion animations with the um, these little plush toys known as the the Kodak Colorkins. I used to take one picture, move them, take another picture, do them again, and back do it back and forth. And I would ask my parents to print out the pictures. And then this talent went on and on through my years through elementary school where I did little um, picture books when I was a little kid. And then, um, then I moved on to, then I moved on to doing some animations that were done on PowerPoint presentations, Adobe Photoshop and MS Paint before I came up with the concept of denimation. And how do I came up with that concept? It's because um, I've noticed that I've noticed that I've been growing my animation skills and I always wanted to start a company. So this has been my dream. That idea came in when I was 11 years old. I've been having this idea and Sandy and Patrick noticed the all, they just noticed my gifts. So what they did is that they helped me get my company started. So just for like a little bit of context and clarification, you started doing stop motion animation with your plush toys before grammar school. So we're talking somewhere between the ages of four to six years old is when you started to first begin playing with animation. Yeah. And also for clarification, Patrick and Sandra are your aunt and uncle, and they were the people who helped facilitate you. That's right. So at 11 years old, you were like, this is what I love to do. What I do is not only about telling, it's showing. Well, show us some. Here's some examples of books that I've done when I was like this, when I was that um, 11 or 12. Those are my, that's how they noticed my little talent there when I was younger. This is what they look like. Very nice. This is what they look like when I was around, um, I used to do these when I was around 12 or 13. But then after I've done these little picture books for so long, I wanted to do something more than that. I want to do animation. Was there a particular cartoon that you looked at and realized I could do that? Or did it come from just the picture books? Well, um, all the cart many of the cartoons that I've watched over the years definitely inspired me to do so. But there's one particular types of there's one particular person that I admired the most who I thought he had Asperger's, the creator of Pokemon, Satoshi Tariji. Satoshi Tariji, he started his um, video game comic book company, Game Freak, when he was 17 years old, alongside with his um, friends. They began as a fan, as a fan magazine, <laughs> a fan magazine. <-a> <laughs> it's hard to pronounce magazine and fan. Fanzine. 
They started a fanzine company, Game Freak, before it became an official video game company. So I set out to beat Satoshi Tariji's record by starting the animation at age 14. For the viewers and listeners, I was their first client. I did a little sh uh, short web series. Ah, this is Pete. And this is Pete's life. Under the Doghouse. You did the animation for Under the Doghouse, and if you're on YouTube, you're seeing it right now. And if you're not on YouTube, you won't even hear this. It's been 10 years since Under the Doghouse has been released. Since that was your first page up, I'm kind of curious, um, if only just out of curiosity. When you got that first job, and granted it wasn't for that much money, but it was a paid job, were you like, I'm really excited to go. Were you nervous? How was getting your first paid job like for you? Getting my first paid job is definitely something exciting. At the same time, it's lots of work. I didn't realize that um, when getting a job, it I didn't, I thought I had the creative freedom to do things, but I have to do what the client wants. Exactly what it wants. That's what Patrick told me from the start when Danny Mation began. Here you are, you started your company earlier than 14. At 14, you had your first paying client, hi. And then you went forward. How was that like for you? Because again, you're like, granted, you have these abilities. And, and of course, I, I made the joke about more like drive and intensity than an MMA fighter, but really you are an incredibly strongly driven person. How was it like building a business at such a young age? And were there any kind of um, emotional costs to it? Did driving forward like this affect your social life? Did it affect your playtime? How, how did taking on a business at a young age, like a serious business to grow into a big organization, because I know that's your intention, how did that affect you? as a teen, a young teenager. There's many different types of tights and ropes and many mountains to climb as, um, as, I, as I started my company. When starting a company, I didn't realize how not so easy it is to start a company. The benefit for me is I get to like um, get the money, be able to get these um, paid gigs, which is fabulous, and get to create animation content and build up my portfolio. But there are some sacrifices as well. There, one, one of the sacrifices I had to do is um, give up some of the, um, as, unlike many teenagers who play video games, I'm, I won't have any time to play video games. I had some, but not as much as I, not as much as many teens would. But the greatest thing about um, running a company is that, <clears throat> is that you get to, you get to be your own boss, which I thought it was so amazing, but there's so many deadlines that keeps me motivated. Here's a little question for you. How do you relax? Like, cause you spend a lot of time staring at a screen. So when it's time for you to ratchet down to relax, to just enjoy yourself, what do you do? How do you downshift? It's all thanks to Sandy, who's able to help me with the schedule. Sandy, Patrick, and I are both workaholics because um, we, have a, we have a company to run, but Sandy is the one who wants us to take a break. Come on, you guys. You, come on, you two. It's about time to take a break. Um, it really depends on the circumstances whether I want to take a break or not. But the biggest point is once the deadline is finished, the, the, award, the reward comes in, which is the... Um, Taking a break, whether it's vacation or going to and or going to a convention for fun, we make time. And that's what business people do. We make the time. We schedule. Aside from going to vacations or things like that, is there any like small things? Do you or are you pretty much just working all the time until you get to that break? So we do have a schedule that happens. We usually have a Friday off after, um, after the work shifts. So once my shift is done, then I could be able to take a break. We usually work 
at around like from nine to five. All right. Unless if there is some um, tight deadlines that we have to go through, whether it's a big project, if we have a big project, we just have to, we work all nighter. It really depends on the project. For example, I just came back from editing a really huge project from the, um, from the CBS Leadership Pipeline Challenge, and I was the editor for a short film that we created for a nonprofit, nonprofit organization called Friends of the LA River. And our film is called Rewilding. I just edit it without any sleep at all for like two days. I've pulled one of those. Those are rough. What challenges do you find, aside from like finding the time and, and being this businesswoman at a young age, what would you say your challenges are in running your company? My biggest challenges is um, keeping everything on schedule and to also, and also my communication is my biggest challenge because sometimes I fumble my words when I, when I talk and in order to keep myself organized, I typically have a list with me to, to keep myself straightforward and get everything done. Otherwise, without a schedule, I'll be like, I'll be like all over the place if this happens. You have the ability to hyper-focus. And you also have a schedule you need to stick to. Does sometimes, does that hyper-focus get you so focused on, you know, the thing you were supposed to be doing from 10 till 2, but now that you're so focused on that, you don't stop at 2 and you're just driving it forward. And because of that, you neglect or miss another piece of the puzzle that day? Sometimes it happens. Are you able to notice that in the moment? Like a half hour has passed and you realize, oh, wait a minute, I shouldn't be doing this. I need to move on to the next thing. Or do you need somebody to actually point it out to you? It really depends on the circumstances. Sometimes I do it myself. Others, um, sometimes Sandy and Patrick would point out, oh dear, you had to focus and concentrate. So I'm usually pretty good at um, going back on schedule when things don't go right. And here's another question about the challenges. Since you are 24, maybe 25 at most, do you find that sometimes in pitching your services to other production companies who might need animation, do sometimes people not necessarily take you as seriously as you feel they should because of your age? It's not only that, but also it has to do with uh, my disability. I have three strikes in me. It's not just the age, but also about being a female, mm -hmm. being a woman of color, and also being autistic. So I don't think. Many companies don't necessarily take it necess don't take it seriously, even though um, it's getting better, even though the industry is getting better of recognizing uh, diverse um, vo creative voices out there. Still miles to go before we sleep. Yeah. So getting so now that with mentioning the autism, do you what are some of the unique challenges it brings to you? The most unique challenges with my autism is the when to daydream and when not to daydream, which means daydreaming for the benefit is it kind of gives me the creative ideas and what the stories that I need to put down on on word or in pictures. The biggest disadvantage, it's sometimes the bad timing. The timing is can be really bad at times when it comes to daydreaming. And I have to have the time to focus and concentrate and not daydream, just continue and focus on work. Another challenge I have is um, being able to communicate correctly and or articulate my words because sometimes my words don't necessarily communicate, doesn't necessarily go through <clears throat> like this right now. It's hard for me to communicate, right? Sometimes my words don't come out necessary because my brain moves faster than my mouth. Honestly, I can relate to that as well. So when you're getting ready to Denny, we're going to take you into the office. We are going to pitch your animation services for this non-existent theoretical TV show I'm using for this example. What do you do to prepare yourself to try to um, help you cope with the fact that your brain is going to be traveling much faster than your mouth will allow you to speak? What I do is I put in an outline. And the reason why I put an outline is because I that way it's a it's a fundamental for me to remain organized on what to talk about in my pitch. And the the best part, the fun part is, is that some companies do allow PowerPoint presentations to keep me on track when pitching a company. 
it's not just then again, it's not just about what you tell them. It's showing them what you could do. Of course, especially with what you do. Now you teach, like, not only are you an animator, like part of your company and your drive is you teach others and specific, like specifically your, you have a big drive to help educate a generation of new artists. So, some of them, if not a lot of them themselves facing similar challenge that to you have. Um, do you feel that your autism help? helps you because you understand how to communicate better to people who have the same issues? It's not just that it helps me communicate better. It's also that I can be able to speak the same language as I do. They do have some. And what I do is I look at their um, animation, their amazing animation work that can eventually become part of that can be part of their career. So we at the animation educate, elevate and empower youth on the autism spectrum by turning their passion into a career path. And I think this is something that helps me communicate right with communicate right with individuals that are like me. And when you are educating them, are you also is it just about the art or do you do you also take time to educate them about the business side? I do. Yes, because it is very important for youth on the autism spectrum to understand what the studios are going. It's real we give them a reality check on at the animation of what the studios run. What I do is I play the music video to youth on the autism spectrum when they begin the animation classes is the animated rap by Dan Pavelmeyer and Jeff Swampy Marsh, the guys who are the creators of Phineas and Ferb, Milo Murphy's Law, and Hamster and Gretel. These, so once they get to the beat and dance to it, now they get how the animation process works. And since we've been talking about all the things that you've done, and this is, you know, fails, falls, and F-ups, let's talk about one of your F-ups. What would you say, what would you gauge, what would you feel as you are a veteran of business now, at least 11 years, what has been one of your big mistakes? What happened and what did you learn from it? So what I've, there's some two mistakes that I've learned. One from the teaching from animation and the other one from when I was at the summer creative workshop when I was in 11th grade. So the first part is when I was teaching animation in Findlay, Ohio at the Center for Autism and Dyslexia, I was just a little too focused on myself and my little animation demonstration. I got too carried away with my animation stuff. Well, well meanwhile, I supposed to help and look at um, every student's animation work. I cannot do their animation stuff for them. So as a result, some of the students' works end up uh, unfinished or look look very crappy. And I felt if I give them a little bit of help and assistance, then their animation stuff would look so much better. So therefore, I you could say I effed up royalty in the teaching part. So therefore, I had to learn how to stay engaged with my students and show them what to do, not just um, tell them. Now, would you say that this experience helped prepare you for the classes you taught later? Of course it did. Of course it did. And especially because every youth in the autism spectrum do need help. Do need help when they need, when they get stuck in their animation work. Great. And now your second mistake. The second mistake, it was from the summer creative workshop when I was in 11th grade. So when I attended the summer creative workshop for animation, I was just doing very minimal stuff, very, very minimal stuff. Even though I found out that editing is my biggest strength, I wasn't, I wasn't doing, I was, I wasn't doing, I was just only doing minimal stuff and just focusing on just uh, what, what suits me. I shouldn't be procrastinating is the, is the thing. I only did minimal and I felt, and I felt so bad. So you stayed in your comfort zone there. You, you stayed with where you knew your strengths were and kind of weren't going to, you weren't doing as much with other aspects that were also expected of you. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, that was when we were doing a short, that was, that was during the two weeks of the summer creative workshop where I stayed in the dorms and did very little, 
did very little, even though I learned how the animation, how the, um, the animation process worked in the summer creative workshop, even though I learned all these skills, um, then again, I didn't do much. Okay. Well, thank you for coming out with those. Taking a step out of, um, the business side or whatnot, what would you say the greatest challenge, like, what would have been the greatest advantages that you might have gotten from being on the spectrum and what have been the greatest disadvantages to you in your life? The greatest advantage for me is that is my ability to focus and concentrate. I have the I have the creativity to help youth on the autism spectrum. It's the communication. Being able to speak the same language is so amazing to help a youth helping youth on the autism spectrum be able to build their build up their talent that can be potential for a career. But the biggest um, challenge as a person with autism is, is learning how to motivate yourself, is learning how to motivate myself, and learning how to stay organized. Staying organized and learning to win your client's trust is the biggest, uh, is the biggest challenge. It's, then it, it goes back to showing, showing them what you can do. And speaking about showing them what you could do, recently, you showed a lot of people things you could do. You were on a, and I don't normally talk about people's actual projects or whatnot, but I mean, you're you, you're, you're, you're Danny. So you were on the first season of the American version of Love on the Spectrum, which first off, kudos to you, because that's a bold move. That's really exposing yourself in a very vulnerable way. How did you decide to do that? How did that come about? Well, um, I had first, it began, we had a short film made by when I was in university made called Danny 101. It was made by a person who um, did the documentary and Kian, the director of, of Love and the Spectrum saw it and he was looking for potential people on the autism spectrum that could be part of the show. He saw the short and he contacted me and see what location he would like to see me. So at the time I was teaching a Saturday animation workshop that is in, that is a called, that was called Music Space Studios and Kian visit and did an interview. It was in the beginning, it was in the beginning of 2020. I was being interviewed. I was so excited to be part of the show until the pandemic hit. The pandemic hits in March. March 11th was when the pandemic hit and they and the process just slowed down until the next until the next year. I was finally being able to be accepted to be on the show. I was definitely so excited because um the reason why I really wanted to be on the show is because all my workload gets in the way of my dating life and it's just so hard to to get the time. And, and I've, it was so amazing that I get to have the time to be on the show and to find a potential love interest. During the film process, um, Kian and his crew were definitely just, um, were like my wink people to me because they're always helping me be myself and do whatever I want. However, um, what I should have have done in the show is, um, is that I shouldn't be expressing my feelings out loud to the guy that I first dated. It's especially it's a bl especially because it's a blind date. I shouldn't be expressing myself out loud or kissing on the first date. I which is my total mistake for me, which I should have have done. I, I have to admit, like seeing you on the show, because I watched the original Love on the Spectrum. I'm not big on reality TV show, and I don't really regard Love on the Spectrum as reality TV because you could clearly see that the filmmakers intentions were honest. They were trying to help and you fall in love with the people. Like I remember, I, I think his name was Sam from the first season. He, he's just really excited to find a date in the way they're helping him. And you could also see when somebody would get uncomfortable on a date, the person with the camera was kind of checking in and making sure they were okay. They, they were there to help. It, it did seem much more like a pure, documents Terrian style helpful thing versus reality TV show. It's a documentary. Even in that first date where you came off excitable, you also came off very well. 
as a result, when it released, um, I get these unexpected um, people that um, wanted to take pictures of me, which is really nice. The um, the in-person side is really nice. However, um, people can be toxic in online. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, people were shaming on me for what I've done to the first date. What they try to do is they villainize or defame me, which is like um, pretty wrong. But at the end of the day, I have to admit it. And move on. Well, yeah, I mean, my personal advice that you didn't ask for on the haters online is screw them. Who cares? None of these people would have the nerve to say something like that to you directly if you were standing in front of them. I know from the original Love on the Spectrum, because they did the two seasons, and there were a couple characters who reoccurred. Are there plans for you, if they're doing a second season, for you to be involved in that? Yes, I am definitely would go forward for the second season. What was your favorite part of being on the show of anything? And it, it doesn't have to be a, a date. What was your favorite thing about it? The entire experience. My favorite thing about the experience is um, getting to see myself on film and um, letting myself to be who I am and be my true authentic self is also my favorite part and getting to see myself um, in camera. If there's anything I ask you that's sort of like, can't talk about that, just be like, nope, can't talk about that. But I'm curious, since there were other people and other couples who their storylines in no way, shape or form intersected with yours, but did you meet them during production or after production? Have you made friends with, uh, I, I wish I could remember the names, uh, but you're not supposed to mention names, but like there was the, there was the girl who had, um, like the stuffed animals and she, she met a guy and they really clicked and they were adorable to watch. Like, did you get to meet her and meet her boyfriend? I actually, um, knew of her ever since, um, we saw each other from Spectrum Laboratory. So y you knew, you, you've known her from before. I have known her from before, and especially we were um, featured in the first document. One of the first documentaries we'd be featured together was um, Generation A. That's that's one of the other documentaries that were featured before Love the Spectrum came. So coming out of this, aside from the experiences of dating and, and romance, did you gain some new friendships out of it? Um, new friendships? Well, my second date... I've gained a friendship with the second date. We still remain friends. We chat each other through text, seeing how they're doing. We kept, we kept in touch. That's nice. And he also is into animation. He also, he's also the guy that made me laugh with his uh, Ren and Stimpy impression, which like, <laughs> you saw that clip. Yes. Out of curiosity, since he is into animation, are you, um, are you... I don't want to say mentoring because that kind of puts like a really this type of relationship description into it. But are you kind of like um, advising, giving him some tips, helping him out a little bit? Occasionally, if uh, if he asks questions, what I can do. That's good of you. That's very nice of you. In being on love on this in, in the spectrum, what would you say was the thing that made you most nervous, at least at f at first? Going into a blind date was technically the most nervous part, <laughs> but you remembered um, Sandy, which you from Love of the Spectrum. She tries to give me something to calm me down, and there, in your face, the shot. It was, I mean, I, I've known, like, I've met both Patrick and Sandy uh, originally at the Animation Guild thing for Bill Plimpton, um, who I will mention on this. and. Um, They've always been so supportive and loving with you. And it was flat out adorable to watch them, you know, going like, oh, our girl out into the big world around you and trying to help you and guide you. And I know you're back there, Sandy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you can hear this as I'm saying it. Um, it was it was adorable because you do have this wonderful support structure. You're you're aunt and uncle truly, truly love and adore you and truly want it, want the world for you. And it was, it was lovely to see that on camera <laughs> in, in such a personable and occasionally, um, 
charmingly awkward way. Uh, what are your final thoughts on Love on the Spectrum? Being on Love of the Spectrum is an incredible experience for me. So if, and I just want to prove um, people on the autism spectrum that um, you can date. It's about, it's not just me. It's about, um, it's all, it's all five others that people on the autism spectrum can find love. If I can find love, you can find love. I, I think really the overall message is people are people, whether you're on the spectrum or you're not, we're all human. And there's no reason to consider differences as anything other than what they are, which is just differences in personality. And everyone is deserving of love. <laughs> and everybody has difficulty finding it from time to time. Denny, you are a driven person. You are a beautiful person in so many different ways. I really appreciate you coming on. And now that we're towards the end of this, I want you to take this moment take a deep breath, and I want you to just egregiously and with malice of forethought, plug yourself. Just absolutely, where can we find you? What can we look at you? What can we do with you? Where are you? Okie doke. So you can actually, you can find me and you can find my company at www.denimationentertainment.com where we have, where we not only we provide um. Not only we just showcase our animation work, but we also provide our one-on-one -on -one sessions for youth on the autism spectrum. If you're interested, we do have a social media under Danimation Entertainment on on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram, Danny Bowman One, Danny Bowman on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn, Danny Bowman. Danimation Entertainment also has a LinkedIn as well. You can find me on TikTok, yeah, Danny Bowman One on TikTok, or you could just Google me. Or find me on Twitter. You know, I've known Danny for a long time, and she still never ceases to amaze me. Now, if there was a question you would have liked to have asked Danny, just drop it in the comments, and I will pass it along. As for me, follow me on all the socials. You can find me at Bruce Naxon just about everywhere, and also fails, falls, and f-ups. Now, next week. I talk to a man who is truly a visionary. In fact, you can call him the Walt Disney of water displays. I, I think I have an ability to judge what seems like it probably can't be done, but I've got a feeling, no, it, it can, uh, and, and we can go there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not stupid enough to jump off of a tall building without a parachute. I, I can usually tell. <laughs> <laughs>